Hello, everybody. My name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I am an author, idiot, and loin streamer, and today is the best day of the month, Lemoy. And today is a very special day, special day indeed, because we're going to meet your loved ones. That is, your very special loved ones. If you know, you know. But everybody will be in the know here very soon. Before we get started, number one, if you enjoy what I do here on the channel, please remember to like, share, and subscribe for more. Number two, if you would like to be featured on the channel, check out the links down in the description below. The number one way to be featured is through Lamai, what we're here doing today, which is I give you a prompt, you write a short story using that prompt, and on the first Monday video of the month, we bask in your creativity. The second way to be featured is if you are an indie author and you have a book out or a book that is coming out, if you submit it to the Fresh Meat feature, that first chapter and the cover will be right here on the channel shown to whoever is enticed by its beauty and hopefully that'll help more readers find your work to go and get the rest of the details the third thing is if you would like to check out any of my books they're available at any of your favorite places to get books including the local library upon request Body More Zero, my newest novel featuring these fine gentlemen to my left, will be coming out this October. Get ready. With that said, let's jump into the reason that we are all actually here, and that is to meet the loved ones. That is the prompt that I gave you all this month was to write a story using a home appliance shifter romance. The more puns, the better. So... As you could see, I found my love interest on the Home Shopping Network. And I hope that many others have found success and have practiced a lot of safety. Because everybody knows that when your lover is a toaster or a blender or even a vacuum cleaner, a lot can go wrong. However, when your lover is a Mr. Drip, you know what I'm saying. The first story is by Mae Tanner. At dusk, Batras slipped into the collection of miserable mud huts. He chose a larger one and peered through the door, which opened onto what appeared to be a utility room. The scanner in his visor detected a heat source covered by a pile of vegetation on one side of the room. His lips twisted into a sneer. It was probably a banked fire. He moved on to the door in the far wall. In the next room, a mutant lay in a pile of straw. He hummed to himself. The harvest was about to begin. Imril's monster rolled off him and onto its legs. He sat up. Monster? The mobile shrub scuttered toward the door to his mother's room. He dove at it, throwing his arms around it. Don't go in there. Mama don't like it. It wiggled out of his grasp and tundraled away. It wriggled out of his grasp and tundraled away. He chased it into his mother's room and froze inside the door. A towering figure, nearly twice as tall as an adult, bent over his mother's bed. This had to be a wicked man from Evil City. Emerald's monster crawled on top of the bed and crouched over his mother as brown tendrils wavering. The stranger jerked back, slammed its skull against the ceiling, and yelped in pain. He dropped a knife and reached up to rub his head. Emerald darted toward... Emerald darted forward with a wordless cry, grabbed the knife, and plunged it into the intruder's leg. The human lunged at Emerald, but the boy darted through the door, out of the house, and into the open, shouting for help. He'd nearly made it to the next hut when something grabbed him by the ankle and dragged him back. He crawled at the ground, fighting the pull. The grip on his ankle loosened with a crackling sound, and Emerald scrambled behind the closest hut. Once he felt safe, he peered out from behind the hut. A person assigned to guard duty stood beside his home, pointing a shiny object at a human, who stood, tugging at the visor over his eyes. Osman hooked Kindle's disruptor on his belt and grabbed a tangler. Kindle had told him that the tanglers were single-use, and they often had a dozen of them, but he'd use as many of them as he had to. He hadn't seen a human other than Kindle since he'd fled the laboratory. The tangler wrapped around the human, and he'd tumbled to the ground. Fion stepped to his side. Where do you think he came from, and how did he find us? Asman knelt beside the human and pulled the helmet off of the man's head, revealing a face of a stranger. The man spat at him. Asman curled his lips. The spittle had landed on the towel that he wrapped around his face and the head in Kindle's memory. 
You're a dead man. Not long after we fled the laboratory, the human who helped us was briefly exposed. He died a couple of months later. We've traveled much deeper into the desert than we were then. I can already see sores on your face. The sapling inserted roots into every break in the symbiont outer layer from which the fluid escaped. It absorbed the fluid that had already flowed out, becoming waterlogged. Deep into the sapling's DNA, an alarm sounded. Symbionts that leaked too much fluid became inert and unable to provide nutrients. The symbiont was superior to any other recorded in the DNA, as it provided both fluid and nutrients. The sapling secreted fresh sap and sealed the breaks in the symbiont outer layer. The sap hardened, and no further fluid leaked. The sapling went dormant. A small hand gripped Asmund's shoulder, and he glanced up. A young man stood beside him. That human hurt Mama. Where is she? The child pointed to a large hut nearby. Fian stepped forward and pulled the child into his arms. She nodded at Asmund. You go in and check. I'll watch over the boy. Inside the hut, the largest shrub Asmund had ever seen rested on the bed made from straw. He rolled it off of the bed, and underneath where the mobile shrub had rested lay a naked woman. A band wrapped around the woman's neck, and another trapped her hands to her waist, with a third bound her leg together, pressing the woman's heel against the backs of her thighs. The woman's eyes opened. I mean, the sap, the mobile plant is very, a very creative take. <laughs> when I read mobile plant, I think of like a planter with wheels on the bottom, and it's like a a sentient plant that like drives itself around. A lot of perspectives in such a little space. There was some great description that really pulled you in while reading this. Thank you for submitting May. The next story is by John Mori. It's titled Toasty, A Tragedy. This better not end in raccoon deaths. Oh baby, you make me so hot. It all started when Kevin had used rubber tongs to pluck the toast from his brand new toaster and it moaned. No. She moaned. She must have been some sort of transformer or whatever they were called because it's just what she said. She transformed. Somehow, the little Black & Decker appliance had unfolded into a woman of gloriously chrome-plated curves and twisting, sensuous wires. Just call me Ms. Decker, she said, and I'll be all yours, big boy. Kevin was overwhelmed. The tantalizing aroma of crisp, burnt bread, the warm hum of electricity, the heat radiating from her unseen coils, throbbing with culinary desire. I, I can be as sweet as raisins and cinnamon, she purred as she leaned in, metal fingers caressing over his ribs, or as tangy as the oldest sourdough. I am yours. Uh, how? he asked. I mean, how, how, how are you? Uh, how, how? I just love the way you turn my dial, the way you press my lever, the way you work those tongs. I can be demure as her weight, spicy like everything, Bagel. I can even be your French bread. But, but you're a toaster. Um, your toaster, she said, and he felt the warmth from radiating coil that served as her tongue. Please heat your baguette inside my slot. You just know how to power me up. Still confused, Kevin put the tongues down only for Miss Decker, the toaster girl, to catch his hand. No, she said. I like the rubber. He dropped the tongs with a panicked yelp, only for the toaster woman to draw him fully into her steel embrace, her tiny arms wrapped around him. His lips met hot metal, burning and yet so eager, so warm, so tasty and crumb-filled. Almost on reflex, he lifted his hand, fingertips brushed against what would have been soft on a real woman, but now was solid chrome. Let go, she whispered huskily into his lips. My ego... Overtaken by desire, by need, by hunger, he hadn't eaten breakfast yet. Kevin returned the chrome woman's embrace. Fingers brushing over dials and levers and that long power cord. Go ahead. Turn my heat up. Press me down until I spring. Spread yourself on me like cream cheese. Melt all over me like butter. 
I'll be your bagel, he said. Your chowl, she sighed. Your croissant, your rye. All he could have ever wanted, all he ever could have needed, was wrapped up in her smooth touch, her metallic warmth, and the eager heat building between their bodies. He could spend his whole life gazing into those fiery eyes, feast upon those chrome lips, let her surround him, told him, be held by him. And now, with the culmination of all of his lonely dreams and hungry desires eagerly burning in his arms, Kevin gave himself to her, his love and lust aching, coiled with the tensions of a lever almost ready to spring, of toast just beginning to be burnt black. I've... I've always needed you. I've always wanted you, always desired you. She purred every time you filled me with bread, stuffed me with shrewd, or loved me with paninis. But now I'm yours, forever and evermore. Our love melted like cheese on a breakfast sandwich. I can't stand it anymore. Take me, take me, my lover. Kevin gingerly took the tongs and slipped a slice of this morning's freshly buttered bread into Miss Decker's slot. She moaned, eyes and tongue glowing power cord tensing, lever ratcheting down with tout tension. Yes, 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 give me a toast twice burnt, slathered with decadent butter and jelly, more, more, push that bread deeper, feel the springs click, heat me up, use your tongs, oh yes, oh yes, oh, 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 Miss Decker suddenly spewed a mass of burnt crumbs from her slot and her mouth, spraying the entire kitchen and Kevin with stale, with old stale burnt carbon. Some of it got into his nose and he sneezed, which made some of it, which made some of it go down his throat and he coughed, which sent some into his eyes. Oh no, she squeaked. I'm so sorry. I guess I haven't been cleaned in a while. Are you okay? Kevin, still coughing, grabbed a hand towel to clean it off his face, but only succeeded in getting more greasy crumbs stuck into his hair. I swear, I'm usually, I usually don't go off like that. Not so soon, at least, the toaster woman stammered. Please, please let me clean you off. I'm so sorry. It's okay, Kevin sputtered. Not your fault. Ugh. But you're covered in crumbs. I'll just take a shower, Kevin said. It's okay. You're not mad? I'm not mad. Do you still love me? Miss Decker, you burnt me up. You make me so warm inside, please. Let me make it up to you. He smiled. Just let me take a shower and it'll be fine. Oh yes, what a wonderful idea. She brushed her fingers over his cheek and then took him by the hand. Let's go enjoy ourselves a bath together. Kevin led his chrome lover into the bathroom, to the shower, the tub, undressing hastily and shivering at her chrome touch. Coroner's report. 38-22-94. Subject was found deceased in his home, electrocuted by a toaster in his bathtub. We have ruled it as a death by misadventure, not intentionally inflicted. For the sake of his family, I suggest we omit exactly which part of the deceased was stuck inside the appliance when he was found. Man, just when you think you've seen everything, the coroner said, wiping the sweat from his brow. I swear, I'm getting too old for this. In the distance, at the edge of his hearing, he heard a telltale spring in the lunchroom toaster. Oh good, my pop-tarts are ready, he said, and went to enjoy his snack. Nicely done, Riddy. <laughs> nice twist at the ending. Nice. Also, all of the puns. Excellent job with all of the puns. I don't think I could have seen that coming for your end. The next story is by Gaochan, called Perfect Dryer. Day of Lightness, 3-14-28-50, era of flower and moisture. Great strides were made in fermenting the civilization centering around dough. For not only had man of dough risen from the ashes of man of flesh and blood, but also at those that were once tools of cookery. Beings of metal, plastic, and silicone. Beings of sentience, intelligence, and emotion. They were once but myths, yet those dough men and women, blessed with fortunate knots in them, had not only seen or met them, but connected and fallen in love with them as well. The war raged on. In order to survive, eyes were closed, hearts had darkened, and the conscience had dimmed. 
marinara with pineapple concentrate, a foul and evil creation, a contagious disease, and the sauce of pain and suffering for all of the dough people. First used in an armed conflict right away, it showed the true face for being an infectious scourge. Lean Queenie was once a fair, slim, and passionate young woman. She was the best, most gentle, most fragrant, and tangy of all of the Doe girls. Alas, during the fight, she was caught in the crossfire, and Mariana had no concern for how good of a Doe person she was. She was the reason, and the only reason, Sir Mixalot and Mesh Grillman would embark on the journey to find a mysterious sage together. Sage Itcher, his name was. Tales told in the whispers by Doman of old and new said that he knew the answers to almost any problem. He for sure would have been the answer to curing the disease of Mariana. The mountainous roads and the humid weather were unkind to the metal skin and flesh. If either of them was to convert back to their original shape, they would surely begin to rust, and yet maintaining their human form would continue to drain their energy. Ugh. Griller. You doing okay? Not out of spins, are ya? Sir Mixalot looked back as he got onto a small hilltop. Mind your own burning business, Spinner. Mesh Grillman shook his head. His chiseled abs, adjustable heated skin, and muscular exterior were helpful in attracting potential mates, but not very useful in regenerating stamina. On the other hand, Sir Mixalot was pale and had a big bottom, but. With the motor engine inside, his energy level was always way ahead of the others. A stone castle is just ahead of us. Make haste. If we can't make it, Sir Mixalot pointed forward with his sharp, stumpy finger forward. Oh, come on, with stamina like that, how are you going to compete for the love of Queenie? Shut up, Mesh Grillman roared. At least I have a bang-up body and abs. What the hell do you have, fat bull? Growl all you want. I'm still a giant engine that could and others would. Sir Mixalot laughed and thrusted his pear-shaped hips back and forth. Just try to keep up. Through the winding and desolate village and passageway, they found their way to the bottom of the flight of stone stairs. Sir Mixalot joked about leaving Mesh Grillman behind, but still slowed down a few times for his travel buddy to catch up. Thanks, dude. Mesh Grillman patted Sir Mixalot on the shoulder before his eyes opened wide at what appeared to be the top of the staircase. Holy crab! It was a giant crab, almost completely made of dough, whose exterior was covered in mold and shiny glass shards. Sage Itcher. Sir Mixalot and Mesh Grillman mustered up the last bit of strength and dragged himself up the stairs to kowtow before the dough crab. Please, wise one, we seek your wisdom and your assistance. We came from the distant city of Flowerland. We braved past a great distances for a chance to be your granted audience. What do you seek from the delicious crab like me? The dough crab clicked its cracked mouth. I know nothing of this world, and I itch no one. Please, just tell me what you need and let me get on with my day, young mixer and young electric grill. We want to know how to cure marinara, Sir Mixalot and Mesh Grillman spoke at the same time. The dough crab looked like it almost choked on the word, but it immediately gathered itself. And for what purpose do you seek this knowledge, young appliances? You should know. I take no sides in the conflict between the man of flesh and blood and the man of dough. They are both the pain in my bottom shell. We are not here for war. Mesh Grillman stepped up and flexed his abs while heating up his front torso to get rid of the moisture that he'd gathered and hoping that the crab would find the sight pleasing. We are here for love. For love, the doe crab narrowed its eyes. Yeah, Sir Mixalot stepped up. We're in love with the doe girl. Her name is Lean Queenie. She was infected with marinara. She's dying, so please, we need your help. We... We can never live without her, Mesh Grillman bumped his pecs. We really need your help, Sage. I see, 
the doe crab thought for a moment before its body began sinking into the ground below its legs. In the back of this mountain you will find fan blades. The lost creation of dry blowers is your answer. To save her life you must abandon your ego and work together as one. And here, the small booklet was thrown on the ground in front of the two young appliances before the doe crab had fully disappeared. Their way back seemed much plainer and easier than their way to the stone castle. The cure was simple. Sir Mixalot would take a mixer blade and bowl off to put on the fan blades on his engine while Mesh Grillman put up his heated grill mesh to heat the airflow. The hot air dried the marinara up in seconds, and they could simply peel the sauce away from Lean Queenie's body. She would need time to grow parts of her already corrupted body back, but she would be okay. And so it's a happy ending. The queen, Lean Queenie, is going to be just fine, and then she will be able to pick her lucky bachelor, Maybe she will get two bachelors, the Mix-a-Lot and the Grill. And uh, then you will have, I mean, what happened? What I've, I, I feel like when you're going with a lean queenie, it's very likely that she's going to go for the grill so that you can, you know, cook her innards. But you could very much prepare her innards with that boundless energy. Great job, Egal Chan. The next story is by Thursia Mead, and I don't believe I recognize your name. So welcome, Thursia Mead, and I hope you had fun with the prompt. The 34-year-old single mom of two was standing barefoot in the kitchen wearing an oversized stained vanity and a pair of Cookie Monster pajama pants that were way too big for her that were way too big for her, her long gray chestnut brown hair and a sock bun. It was 8.30 in the morning, her kids were at school, and this was the only me time that she had in a little while. She yawned, rubbed the sleep out of her eyes, and made herself a cup of instant coffee. She let out a sigh that she didn't know that she was holding. If coffee can find its perfect mate, then why, oh why, can't I? She thought to herself as she poured some creamer into her cup. She turned around to get some bread and butter to make herself toast when she felt someone rubbing her shoulders. She quickly spun around to see a tall, handsome man with dark hair wearing a pink Hawaiian shirt and a pair of jorts. Who are you and where is my coffee? She asked, trying to find something to defend herself with and ultimately landed on a hand mixer. Here. The th here's the thing, he said, rubbing the back of his neck. I am your coffee. Huh? She asked as she slowly put her hand mixer down. You asked for a perfect mate, and that wish is what made me. I get the part, but like, why are you wearing a Hawaiian shirt? She asked. Oh, there's some Hawaiian punch in the cup, She he replied. Oh yeah, my five-year-old was using my cup this morning. I guess I should have washed it out, she thought to herself. Makes sense to me. She smiled. So, we're soulmates. He nodded, grabbed her hands, and pulled her in close. She noticed that he smelled like coffee and kissed him on the side of his face. I've found my perfect mate, and it's coffee. This feel, that, that line specifically feels so perfect for a writer times coffee fic. <laughs> <laughs> like a little novella. It's, I also just specifically, specifically, the corniness of I have found my perfect mate and it's coffee. Simple, fun, sweet. Thank you so much for submitting. The next story is by Machined Hearts. I stood anxiously at the base of the castle's wide marble staircase, which led to the double wooden doors. Anxiety welled with each step toward the entryway. I was here to do a job, and I would do it because I'm a professional, damn it. Thunder rumbled and a bolt of lightning lit in the evening sky. The ringed door handle gave way without much effort. Within, the air was cool, much more than the outside. In the shadows, figures shifted, silverware clanged, and wood bumped against stone. A lone figure emerged, stepping into the light of the lone candelabra illuminating the atrium. The stranger adjusted the tie of his three-piece suit and righted his crooked glasses. The master has been awaiting your arrival. His accent was prim and proper, and the way that he referred to my client unsettled me. 
N nice to meet you. It is now a good time to, to meet still? The butler paused for a moment in contemplation. There hasn't been a good time for a long while, I'm afraid. If you're asking if now is the right time, then yes, he motioned toward a carved twin staircase. A bolt of lightning struck outside, illuminating the room through stained glass at the top. The grand entry looked unused, abandoned. With a measured pace, the butler picked up the candelabra from the stand and ushered me along. After hesitating, I relented and followed the butler up the velvet-lined stone steps. While ascending, I noticed a rustling above. A cart shifted, causing silverware to rustle, echoing throughout the hall. Do you make everyone work in the dark around here? I couldn't hold back an aggravated tone. The butler didn't stop nor slow his measured pace. The light has left this place long ago. But we all have a job to do, so we endure. He continued down the long, winding hallway, lined with dusty tables and unlit candles. I don't know how to respond to his comments, so I continue to follow. The butler's strange phrasing and odd word choices unsettled me, but I press on, despite my unease. The butler pushed open the grand mahogany doors to the master bedroom. In the center of the room was a floating golden stemmed rose under a glass dome, its crimson petals already half wilted. Sir, per your request, the— The butler started. Leave us! A booming baritone voice echoed out from the wooden A booming baritone voice echoed out from behind a wooden partition on the far right end of the room near the ajar balcony doors. Hey I couldn't hold back my anger. There's no way to that that's no way to talk to him. He's just doing his job. Impulse took over and I rushed toward the voice. A lightning bolt struck in the distant mountain, illuminating the room, but for a moment. Please, miss. That let's not be rash. The butler's voice was shaken, fearful. No, I want to hear an apology from this negligent. I reached the balcony doors and placed a hand on the partition. D d don't do that, the butler insisted, still quivering with dread. I'm not going to work for a... I rushed around the facade and found myself face to face with a cappuccino machine, though a very expensive and elaborate device, one that seemed would... One that seemed would make a very tasty beverage indeed. What is the meaning of... Get out! The cappuccino machine boomed, shaking the glass panes in the balcony doors. I turned to the butler, just as terror washed over the poor man. In a poof of sparkling dust, his form disappeared, and at where his feet once were appeared a robotic vacuum. Oh dear, I uttered. Oh my gosh, there are so many ways that I could see this going. Number one, I thought that she was going to like step onto the balcony and there's just going to be a refrigerator there. Number two, then I start thinking about like video game levels where people have replaced people with objects. Kind of like Gary's mod when you just kind of <laughs> replace characters with different objects, especially an object hunt. And then the objects moving around. The third thing is, what an interesting, like, a take on Beauty and the Beast, but it's like a haunted house. And it's still all of the furniture, but it reads like a haunted house. And then you could either go, the person that went in the haunted house is crazy or they're not crazy. But either way, fun. I mean, and it, and it obviously had its references to Beauty and the Beast very early on. But fun. There are so many ways you could go with that. Thank you for submitting. The next story is by Thomas Leon Writing. Welcome. I think this is your first time. I don't recognize your name. Welcome and thank you for submitting. She said it and she meant it. Still, she wishes that she could take it back because there is no way that he could commit to her request. No way that he can make her feel enough, make her feel full. It's a problem that they struggled with every day this summer. That he can't make her feel anything because she felt nothing. I am done, she thinks to herself, feeling defeated. I give up. She sat there, flat and empty. Life had taken her pitcher of emotions and emptied it and refused to refill her. But she craved to be full, to feel something. Are you serious? He asked for the third time. She mouthed the words almost to confirm that her lips were capable of shaping what she intended. She didn't answer, only looked to him with craving eyes that looked right through him. Or maybe they saw him for what he really was. 
gazing upon a real him, whose words gazing upon a real him, whose words were as hollow and empty as she was now. Okay, he said, giving in. His words crashed into the barren and white walls that made up a room, only a full-sized bed and a single starving spider, patiently waiting for its next meal by maniacally expanding its web, contributed to the room's decor. He turned away from her, squatted with his knees to his chest, and began. His shins compressed and folded on themselves, and a glimmer returned to her eyes. She had seen this absurd transformation only a dozen times. Mesmerized, she anxiously sat and watched her own personal mystic theater. This pain must be unbear this pain must have been unbearable. She enviously thought as his shins appeared as a solid piece of exposed bone, and his head was forced up and back, snapping his neck into position. Expectedly, he lost consciousness, and all that was left behind was a version of himself, reconstituted into flesh and bony clothing iron. She stared, and her zombie-like gaze came to life as his mouth, or what was once his mouth, was left agape with grotesque apprehension. He wasn't a large man. He was thin and frail, with pale skin and thin lips. Constantly, he would be called into question about his health. His own mother took studying parasites, viruses, and all sorts of ailments, wondering which disease was stealing life from her son. Contrasting his looks, he possessed this amazing ability. Through all of his mother's studies, she would have never guessed that his appearance was a product of the pieces that he would lose of himself as he transformed. She would have to wait some time for him to return back to himself, and even longer to convince him to do it again. But he loved her. All of the threats that she knew held no weight, and inevitably, he would give in to her requests, bending and breaking for her, helping her burn away those numb feelings. A puff of steam erupted from his legs. He was ready, she thought, picking him up by his spine. She hovered her hand over his bone-soft plate to confirm. The heat erupting from him made her habitually flinch away. This is what she had been waiting for. Hiking up her skirts, she exposed her own pale and scarred legs. With a deep inhale, she committed. Pressing bone to flesh, his heat pressed and seared into her inner thigh, and she was in love. Her body erupted into an intense heat, and her heart raced. The room flexed in her vision, brightening and clearing. Dropping the iron, with a painful moan, she collapsed onto the bed, gasping for breath, sweating. She thought that she will stay like this for a while. The transformation will last at least an hour and another three days as he goes through the anguish of returning back to his fragile self. I will stay like this for a while, she thought. A smile cracked her normally stoic face, and she laid there full of fire and pain and love. A unique love for an uncommon iron. What a twist. I didn't, um, I didn't even conceive of this idea that a home appliance shift or romance could be written into a body horror. And I feel like there are some gothic horror elements that could be written into this or that, that could play on this style. What an interesting way to take it. And I never would have guessed that. The next story is by Ben Hayward. When they said that there would be life after death, they weren't kidding. I assumed that if it was true, it'd probably... I assumed that if it was true, I'd probably be a rabbit, a deer, or maybe a dog. Instead, I was brought back as a microwave oven. I love the days that my owner pops a ready meal inside of me and enters the time, and at the end, I swing my door wide open. Sometimes, she leaves a fork in, and it fills my insides with glee and confusion. One time, she made popcorn and left it in too long. My mind races with the thought of that cloth cleaning out my insides. She bought an air fryer recently, and I'm not her favorite child anymore. I watch her as she puts anything inside of it like some kind of whore. She put us next to each other like we're friends. It does not even have a soul. It won't be pleased when a task is completed. That man on the radio is right. Automation is taking jobs from the working man and woman and microwave. I have to destroy it. Send a message to all of the other appliances that I'm the only one worthy of her affections. The stupid air fryer doesn't even warm up cold pizza. What's it even good for? Unfortunately, my feet are made of rubber, but I think that I can move slightly by opening and closing my door very fast. Unfortunately, doing so turns me right, which is the wrong way. 
Now I am facing the wall and the cat is staring at me. My power cable is now wrapped around my legs, but so is the air fryers. I'm heavier than her. I'm built different. I should survive the fall from the kitchen counter. It's just a piece of cheap plastic and I'm made of metal. Here goes nothing. Using my door, I push away from... Using my door, I push myself away from the ledge and we fall together. It falls to pieces. Fragments of over-dried fries fly everywhere. Victory. But something is wrong. There's a crack on my screen and my digital clock is broken. I cried in agony the only way a microwave can. By putting on a short 10-second cooks on a releasing my door at the end. When she came home from work, she picked me up by arms and swaddled me like a newborn and put me in the car. She would fix my broken screen. And who needs a clock when people have phones? When we got to our destination, she dumped me in the trash. It's the apply aside! You should have been happy, I guess. Mr. Microwave. Because now, <laughs> now you have nothing. You have nothing and you have nobody and the garbage. I mean, is this going to be the start of Brave Little Toaster 2? It's gonna be the microwave coming back after getting after getting thrown off the after pushing himself off the counter and then having to explain to his new appliance friends how he tried to murder the air fryer. I bet that air fryer was still under warranty. You done messed up, my guy. You done messed up. Oh my gosh, you guys are so funny. It's so good. Thank you for submitting. The last story of the month is by Kawai Groovy Cat. Now, I have no idea what we should expect here. This is the queen of the love boat. So, get ready. The story is titled Hot and Steamy Confessions, a Microwave Mishap. We got another microwave lover. <laughs> Guys, the microwave is mildly homicidal. I, I would be careful. Like, though, I guess if you like the bad boys slash bad girls... The microwave may be the way to go. Hell is hot, and it's always welcoming new members. But before the lucky ticket holder can come in and face their punishments and internal damnation and stuff, every sinner has to undergo an interview just to confirm that I'm not missing any important information that should have been in the file that God sends me. And yeah, if it wasn't clear, I'm the devil. I seduce humans into sin and falsehoods and all sorts of sexy wrongdoings that God doesn't like. And then I punish those sinners in hell and I am so horrible and awful and evil and... Yeah, yeah, you get the idea. But if there's one thing that you should know about me, it's that I really fucking hate my job. And you'll see when I interview the newest resident of hell. So, uh, Chris and Dell is the name I have on record, and you've been convicted of having an obscene incident with your microwave, which is also listed as your cause of death. Is all of that correct, ma'am? Well, I wouldn't put it like that. Obscene incident makes it sound so... dirty. But there's nothing sinful about love, is there? Even the Bible tells us to love thy neighbor as thyself. So that is why you whip your microwave. Oh, come on, man. That can't be the worst thing that you've ever heard of. Are you actually embarrassed? There's nothing obscene about loving your microwave. It's just a taboo put on by society, a social construct of anything. It's like homophobia. That kind of hatred was brought on by other people, but there's nothing intrinsically wrong with being gay. But then... What's the next taboo to be lifted? So what if my girlfriend just so happened to occasionally take on the form of a microwave? It doesn't mean that she's not still a person. <sighs> okay. Help me understand this. A love affair of yours. And why God decided to send you to hell. Well, aside from God being a bigot, for starters, Mike and I were roommates. Mike? Short for Michaela. She's my girlfriend. Uh, it looks like she's next in line. How about I bring her in and finish you both off at once? Kinky. No, not like that. Neither of you are my type. I prefer redheads. Beep. Bring the next one in. It's time. 
All right, let's not waste any time. State your full name for the record, ma'am. Michaela Rowe Way. But just call me Mike to keep things simple. Right. Would I be correct in presuming that you are the, um, microwave that Miss Dell's obscene incident refers to? It's not obscene, it's... Can it? It's her turn to talk, not yours. Don't make me bring out the talking stick. She's right, though. But yeah, guilty as charged. Now that we're on the same page, both of you please tell me your side of the story in regards to this... incident. Well, it all started a couple months ago. I was so excited to move into a house off campus this semester instead of the shitty dorm rooms that are host to professional bums, but I'll spare you those details. Anyways, I move in a week before classes only to find out that my two other roommates totally ditched me. Apparently they found God and ran off to Thailand and left me to figure out how the hell I'm going to pay rent all by myself. And let me tell you, it ain't cheap where I live. The rent was 2,500 a month. And I think that I made about that much during my summer internship. So that night, I tossed some frozen meal from Trader Joe's into the fancy microwave for dinner and contemplate whether I should sell drugs or post feet pics online to make some quick cash. And then suddenly, a woman appears and tells me, you probably shouldn't let this get cold, cutie. Wow, I can't believe you remember that word for word. I knew that you were the woman of my dreams. Mm-hmm. So, needless to say, I was startled, and I looked over at where my microwave was, and it was gone. Instead, there was this well-rounded hottie handing me my dinner, and she thinks that I'm cute. I pinched myself to make sure that I wasn't dreaming, and it turns out <laughs> the dream didn't end. And then I introduced myself and explained what I was. For reference, me and my whole family are what you would call shifters. We're still humans, but we can turn into certain appliances or devices. Like, for example, my brother can shift into a radio whenever he wants. Well, that's new. And then what happened? I took one look at Mike after she told me her secret, and I was already in love. It was meant to be. At that very moment, I knew that I had found my mate. Mate? Like the werewolf mate? Not like Fred mate? Pretty much. Right. And uh, how long were you two together? Well, my sense of time is totally fucked, but it was probably closer to two months than just one. And I know that because Mike helped me make next month's rent, and we were even able to pay off the next two months in advance. Is that right? And before you ask, we did not start an OnlyFans together. I wasn't going to ask, but carry on. Well, to make a long story short, we cooked crack and sold it. That was not on the record in either of your files. Wait, so that didn't even have anything to do with why we were sent to hell? I think God would have made some mention of it if it was relevant. I knew it. I knew God was a bigoted piece of crap. Yeah, I'm not terribly fond of the guy either. Go on. So we cooked crack and made a whole business out of it. Yeah, and we even masqueraded as a charity so we wouldn't immediately get in trouble. And I figured that's what we would have gotten into trouble for with the man upstairs, but oh well. Noted. Now let's move on to the obscene incident in question. Like I said, it wasn't obscene. I don't. I don't know if I want to spill all of the deets. I mean, we literally died. It's a little embarrassing. Trust me, I've read Kama Sutra from cover to cover in the original Sanskrit. Nothing you say can faze me. Right. Um, so... One day, we decided that we wanted to get down and premarital. Uh, but I wanted Mike to be in her microwave form when we did it. So, as you can imagine, things got hot and heavy pretty fast. 
I really don't want to imagine, but okay. And for context, I'm not a tiny pity microwave that you can barely fit a plate into. I'm half the size of a regular oven in that form. So Chris was able to get all the way inside, like sitting in there. And hey, it's, it's not that different from dripping candle wax. It's in fact, it's better than that because it's less messy. Or at least it was until like, until we finished. Chris is great. The best I've ever had. That implies that there are multiple microwave fuckers in the world. Well, duh. How do you think my bloodline even exists? It's not like we reproduce asexually. The only reason that you've never met another microwave enthusiast is probably because they're still alive. But that's beside the point. You see, Chris was, and I don't mean to blame her for us dying, just a little bit too good. To put it simply, I exploded. That house is probably still a mess of blood and shrapnel. Ugh, I hope nobody's found my corpse yet. I thought of what people would think seeing me like that makes me want to die all over again. Hey now. For all we know, maybe your body's burnt up from the explosion, so keep your chin up, okay? Well, when you put it like that, there's really nothing to regret. I, I would never regret loving you, babe. Aw, me either, sugar tits. <sighs> all right, I think I've heard enough. I sentence you two to six months of dishwashing by hand with bleach and without gloves. Now kindly get out of my office. The two women left the office and were immediately escorted by Satan's minions to the kitchen where a mountain of dirty dishes of Everest proportions, mind you, awaited them. It would be a long, grueling six months of torture, but thanks to the power of love, the bleach didn't hurt their hands that much. Hmm. Oh my gosh, Ruby Cat. <laughs> what a piece. Also, second microwave. Also, second death by home appliance. Look, the home appliance deaths are about to go up because of these circumstances. Home appliance lovers got to be careful with that power. Who would have thought that dating your home appliance would be this dangerous? <laughs> One fourth deaths in this. Was it one fourth? At least, at least the guy, the guy in in Riddy's story, will have something in common with these these fine women. I guess it matters if they both go to hell. But if you know they went to hell for appliance fornication, uh, I don't imagine that uh, Kevin is gonna gonna fare too well in judgment either. Satan's just going to be like, another one? We have another one. How is it we have two of these today? <laughs> well, everybody, those were the story for this month. Let me know what your thoughts are. Which one was your favorite? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Looking forward to next month's feature. Looking forward to next month's prompt. With that said, have a great week. Have a great July. Happy, uh, happy Independence Day coming. And, uh... Don't die. The only people who should come are those who want to meet their monsters. If this is what Agatha wants, I don't know how we can even dispute it. I change lives, baby. And I end them. Sweetheart, no bargains hold. Only fools know restraint. Only losers lose! I've been under the knife so many times, I'm practically immune to it. If your scissors are dull, may I recommend sharpening them with leather? I think I hit you. Bimal says I must have a guardian angel. To enter the ring but abstain from playing is suicidal. Your virtue makes you nothing but a liability. You're gonna die. You're gonna die. You're gonna die.